Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. Some of the things that he was explaining was just so simple, but it was truth that just hit right home. He's changed my life. He's changed my walk. I have a hunger for God now that I've never had before. And this is just the beginning. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Wednesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. I'm in the middle of my second week of teaching from a brand new book I've got entitled, More Grace, More Favor. If you want the favor of God, the grace of God in your life, it says in James chapter 4 that He gives more grace. There are varying degrees of God's grace that you can operate in, and basically the key to it is humility. God gives grace to the humble, but He resists the proud. And we've been teaching on this now for, I think this is my eighth uh, program that I've made on that, and I've still got a couple of weeks to go on it. I've been sharing a lot of things, and yesterday I was, um, man, well, I've shared so much that I really can't summarize it or I'll spend this whole uh, program summarizing it. That's the reason you need to get these materials. But today I want to kind of focus on this little teaching on self-centeredness the source of all grief. Now, this is just one part of the whole teaching here. But if you get this book or if you get the CDs or the DVDs, we are going to throw in this as a gift to you, the teaching on self-centeredness, the source of all grief. And I tell you, that is a game changer. Let me use a passage of Scripture out of Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 10. That verse says, "...only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. And if you put that together with Proverbs chapter 17, and I believe it's verse 14, it says, The beginning of strife is as when one letteth out water, therefore leave off contention before it be meddled with. So in uh, Proverbs 17, 14, it's using the word contention as the beginning of strife. So put that back with Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 10. Only by pride comes contention or the beginning of strife. Now, this needs a little bit of explanation because there's a lot of people that'll say, man, I've got a temper. Seems like I'm always in trouble. I'm always having contention with somebody. And yet pride isn't my problem. I spent quite a bit of time earlier showing that Pride is not just arrogance, thinking you're better than everybody else, but low self-esteem, timidity, shyness is pride. I know that's a shocking statement to a lot of people. If you missed any of that, please go back and look at my previous programs. They're archived on our website, and I encourage you to check it out. But it is absolutely true. Low self-esteem being, having a low self-image is a very prideful person. You are focused on yourself. Pride in its simplest form is just self, uh, self-centeredness. self And it doesn't matter if self is focused on me being better than everybody else or me being worse than everybody else. You are just totally self-centered. You are thinking about yourself all of the time. So if you use that definition, then this says only by pride or only by being focused on yourself is what causes contention, the beginning of strife. That's the only thing. It's not what other people do to me that makes me angry. It's what's on the inside of me that responds to what people do to me that makes me angry. I can't control everybody out here. You know, Jesus said, Beware when all men speak well of you. So... Uh, So spoke they of the false prophets that were before you. If you live a godly life, you will suffer persecution. And so there's going to be people come against you. You can't control all of that. I do know some people that just try and use their faith and believe that everybody's going to love me. Oh, God, touch their heart. Make them love me. Make them treat me right. I don't think that that's possible. The Apostle Paul, again, I quoted that, but 2 Timothy chapter 3 Verse 12 says, Yea, all those who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you never bump into the devil, it's because you're both headed in the same direction. You start going God's direction, it's going to be like swimming upstream. There's going to be resistance. There will be people that come out against you. The only people 
that aren't being persecuted today are the ungodly. But if you live godly, you shall suffer persecution. So persecution is going to come. You can't stop it. The apostle Paul didn't stop it. We aren't redeemed from persecution. But you know what you can do is deal with what's on the inside of you that makes you so hurt when somebody rejects you and does something. Here's a statement that will surprise many of you, but you cannot be hurt. Nobody, let me say it this way, nobody can hurt me without my consent and cooperation. And I know that there are some of you think that's not true. I didn't cooperate. I haven't gone along with it. And yet this person has done this to me and it's just devastated me. But it's you, it's what's on the inside of you that makes you react to them the way you do. Let me give you an example that there was a time that I pastored a church and I got a lot of criticism and I had one man in particular come out and just call me all kinds of names, say that I was a liar, I was a crook, I was stealing money from the church, which didn't even make sense because I didn't take a salary at all from the church. Anyway, it was totally unjust, all of the criticisms that he had. And he was a businessman, and every time I went by his business, I would always stop just to talk to him. So I kind of had a habit of doing that. And after he had had this confrontation with me and told me I was a crook and accused me of doing all kinds of terrible things, you know what? I just forgave the guy because I knew it wasn't true what he said. I didn't know what his problem was, but I wasn't going to let it bother me. I cast my care about it over on the Lord. And the next week I drove by his business and as my habit was, I stopped to go in and talk to him. Jamie was with me and I asked her if she wanted to come in with me and she said, no way. So I went in by myself and I didn't stay very long because he wasn't friendly. It was obvious that he didn't want to talk to me. And so after just a few minutes, I came back out and I told Jamie, I said, well, I don't know what's wrong with him, but something's bothering him. He wasn't friendly the way that he normally is. And she just looked at me and she says, are you kidding? And I said, no, I can tell you something's bothering him. And she had to remind me that the week before he had told me I was stealing money. I was committing adultery. I was getting drunk. He accused me of all kinds of things. And I had forgotten it. It didn't devastate me. You know why? Because I had cast the care about it over on the Lord. I don't have to have people's opinion. I wasn't sitting there wanting to defend myself. I tell you, there is something inside of people that when somebody falsely accuses you, you want to get in and fight and defend yourself. And I'm telling you, that's a recipe for disaster. It'll wind up destroying you. Again, you can't use your face so that you remove all opposition and criticism. Jesus said, you know, it's going to come. You are going to have tribulation in this world. You can't stop that, but you can deal with that selfishness on the inside that has to always be right, has to always be on top, has to always be giving, you know, people giving credit to you. And you can get to a place where the only person that you really care about is the Lord. You can do that. You know, Jonah, uh, the man who was my mentor, he just died recently, and I was just back in Arlington, Texas, and performed his funeral. He was 91 when he went to be with Jesus. But Joe Nay, back when I was still in the Baptist church and I was being persecuted mercilessly for the things that I was teaching, and they were telling me I was of the devil, and, and anyway, it was really bothering me. It was getting to me what they were saying. I went to one of Joe Nay's meetings, and out of all the people that were there, he called me up to the front, and he gave me a prophecy. And this prophecy, it's a long one, but basically it was about he saw me like a runner on one of these oval tracks, a quarter mile track. And I was running a race and I was leading the pack. I was winning the race. But the people in the grandstands were yelling at me and telling me I was doing it all wrong. And Joe told me, he says, I see you getting off of the track and going up into the grandstands and arguing with the people. And he says, even if you win the argument, you're going to lose the race. He says, forget what the spectators are saying. Stay on track. Stay on track. Man, that's been 40 something years ago, maybe 50 years ago. And you know what? That has been a directive in my life. I used that yesterday. We have some things happening that I could get some national press and it might not be positive national press. 
and some people were saying you need to hire a PR firm and and I, I used that exact thing yesterday. I told them about that prophecy and I said, look, I am not going to get into the grandstands arguing with the spectators. I am not here to justify myself. People can think of me whatever they want to. I'm going to stay on track. I'm going to keep doing what God told me to do. You know, I believe that that's humility. That's, that's it. And so again, if you are thinking that it's, no, this person did, this is what made me angry. This is the reason I've got a chip on my shoulder is because I was treated this way. No, it's what's on the inside of you that is responding to that. It is because your reputation, your self-esteem is so important to you. You know, Jesus said that you have to die to yourself. Let me just read a number of scriptures here. This is in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Did you know we are supposed to literally like crawl up on the altar and die to ourselves, become a living sacrifice? A sacrifice isn't in control. And God used this verse to touch my life back in 1967. This is one of the very first revelations of Scripture that I ever got. And, I'm, you know, it's a living sacrifice. This isn't a one-time thing. You, you have to live this. And here I am 50-something years removed from that. I can't say that I do it perfectly, but, man, I am still laying on that altar and every day trying to make myself a living sacrifice to God. You got to die to yourself. Now, if you die to yourself, you could take a corpse and you could put a corpse in front of me and I could spit on the corpse. I could insult the corpse. I could lie about the corpse. I could kick the corpse. And if it's a corpse, it's not going to respond. You know why you respond when you're maligned and people say things? It's because you are so alive to yourself. You haven't become a living sacrifice you are still promoting yourself. But you can come to the end of yourself. The Apostle Paul said in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Notice the Apostle Paul said, I'm crucified. I'm dead. The Apostle Paul was so dead to himself that in Philippians chapter 1, he was writing this from a Roman prison back to the people in Philippi. And he says, don't worry about me because the things that have happened unto me have fallen out rather to the furtherance of the gospel. You know what he was talking about? He was in prison. In Rome, he was in prison for two years. And he was writing to these people who loved him, who were concerned, wondering how things were going. And he says, hey, I'm fine because the gospel is being promoted. He says, everybody in Caesar's household, I've got to witness to every one of them. Did you know how a person could have that attitude, even though they, at that time he had been in prison for nearly five years? And instead of griping and talking about how bad everything was, he was saying, I'm fine because the gospel is being promoted. The only reason that could happen is because he had died to himself. His own comfort and his own personal success and, and reputation and things like this, that wasn't what he was living for. He was living for God. And because he was in prison, he was getting an opportunity to minister to everybody in Caesar's household. He even got to appeal or, or appear before Caesar. And because he loved God and God's kingdom more than he loved himself... He says, I'm fine. And then he goes on to say, he says, I'm ready for whatever God has, whether it's by my life or my death. He was facing possible execution. And he says, I'm fine any way it goes, as long as Jesus is glorified. Did you know when a person isn't afraid of death because they've already died to themselves, it makes you one powerful, secure person. They couldn't intimidate Paul. They'd say, quit preaching the gospel or we'll beat you. He just kept preaching the gospel. They beat him, put him in prison. An earthquake came and the jailer got saved and all the inmates and stuff. And so the next day they come and they turn him loose and he goes and preaches the gospel. How do you tempt or threaten 
a man who's already dead to himself. Put him in prison, he'll get everybody born again. Threaten to kill him, and he's just liable to reach up and kiss you and say thank you because he said in Philippians chapter 1, I believe it's verse 21, he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He says, I'm having trouble deciding whether I want to go to be with the Lord or stay here. I guess I'll stay here because that's for your benefit. He denied himself and put other people ahead of himself. You know what that is? That's humility. If you are afraid of what people are saying and doing and what the consequences may be and stuff like this, it's because you are too alive unto yourself. You are supposed to be a living sacrifice and separated unto God. You're supposed to die to yourself. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. A cross is something that you die on. You know, I know that this isn't popular. I know everybody would rather hear me talk about how to get healed, how to have prosperity, how to do all those things, and I believe in every bit of that. But I tell you, it's, it's much better if you make a, yourself a living sacrifice and to the point that, God, I just want you and I want what you have for me. That doesn't mean that you're going to be treated bad because it says in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. God loves you. And God, if He's sacrificed His Son for you, how shall He not with Him also freely give you all things? Romans chapter 8. I am absolutely certain that God wants you well. He wants you to prosper. He wants you to succeed in everything you set your hand unto. I believe every bit of that. But the way to that victory is not up, but it's down. It's by humbling yourself. When you humble yourself, God gives grace to the humble. And let me point this out, that humility is something you have to do voluntarily. If it's done to you, it's not humility, it's humiliation. And a lot of people get these two things confused. And they, they think, you know, somebody was caught with their hand in the cookie jar. They were caught in a sexual sin or misappropriating money or they do something. And so they come out and they cry, and I'm sorry and I repent and stuff. And they may look like they are truly repentant. But you know how you can tell? is whether they accept responsibility for what they did or if they try and pass it off. There's a man who's a friend of mine. I went to his church for many years. Anyway, he was caught in a... in a, It was a sinful situation. And he admitted that he was wrong. He cried crocodile tears. He even went on national television, was interviewed and told people that, you know, he's sorry. But the reason I don't believe he was truly sorry is because he immediately started blaming other people. And he started saying, well, I was wrong, but they treated me wrong. They should have done this, and I've got rights. And he was still promoting himself. You know what that is? That's pride. True humility is when you just humble yourself. And it doesn't matter. Maybe you did something a little bit wrong and other people punished you maybe more than you deserve. But you know what? You're the one that started the whole thing. And rather than sit there and criticize them for their reaction, you just accept responsibility for what you have done and you don't sit there and criticize other people. This one man I was talking about, he said that, yeah, Christians are the only one that shoot their own wounded. And so he made himself the victim He's the one that caused this whole problem. He's the one that for years, decades, abused people and did things. And then when he got caught on it, he got to where he presented himself as the victim and started saying, these people have been mean to me and all this guy. Kind of... That's not true repentance. You know what true repentance is? That's like the prodigal son. The prodigal son went to his father and said, give me my inheritance. And then he went and wasted it on riotous living women, booze, stuff like this. He became so poor, he was having to feed the pigs and he was so hungry, he was willing to eat the slop that the pigs were eating. And finally, he came to himself. Sad to say, this is when most people come to themselves is when they are in the pig pen and their deal didn't work out. But however you get there, when you come to yourself, he said this, I'm going to go back to my father and I'm going to say, I'm not even worthy to be called your son. 
make me one of the hired servants. He would rather live as a hired servant, even though he was the physical son of the Father. He knew he couldn't claim that. He couldn't do it. He didn't deserve it. He didn't go back making any claims and demands. He humbled himself. That's what humility is. And so a person who is truly sent, and if they are truly humble, they won't blame you for overreacting to their sin. And maybe you, you, they won't go and say, you should now trust me again. No, trust is something that has to be earned. If you've truly repented, then you ought to recognize that trust has to be earned and you may have to live with the consequences of what you've done and the distrust of people until you prove yourself worthy. And if you just go back and say, all right, I've repented. Now you just restore me and you trust me again. No, that's not true humility. You haven't accepted the right responsibility. You haven't dealt with it. You know, David was called a man after God's own heart twice. And David certainly was a sinner. He committed adultery. He committed murder. David was not a perfect man. So when it says that he was a man after God's own heart, it wasn't because he did everything perfectly. You know, there's many things, but one of the things that made David a man after God's own heart was he accepted responsibility for his sins. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, when Nathan confronted him and said, you are the man and you've done this, David repented. And he wrote about it in Psalms chapter 51. I'm not going to take time to turn over there and read it, but you can turn to Psalms 51. And David said, against you and you only have I sinned and done this great evil in your sight. And then he, he didn't blame anybody else. He didn't say, well, it was Bathsheba's fault for taking a bath out there in the public and exposing herself. It was because of, you know, the affairs of state were weighing on me and I was under stress and I just gave in. He didn't go to blaming anybody else. He says, it's against you and you only have I sinned. I deserve everything I've got. And he says, God, what you want is a broken and a contrite heart. That is humility. When you humble yourself, you accept responsibility. In contrast to that, David's predecessor, Saul, when he was confronted, he immediately told Samuel, it's the people. The people made me do it. The people forced me into this. He wouldn't accept responsibility for what he's done. If you've messed up, there is more grace and God is willing to extend that grace towards you, but you need to humble yourself. And you can tell whether you've humbled yourself by whether you are blaming other people, making excuses. It was because I was raised in a dysfunctional family. It was because I was abused when I was a child. It was because of the color of my skin, my lack of education. I didn't have the money. And so this forced me in. No, those things may exist, but you have to accept responsibility. And if you haven't done that, if you're blaming other people or things, then you haven't truly humbled yourself. You've just been humiliated. Humiliation is something done to you. Humility is something that only you can do. It's an attitude of the heart, and it will be expressed through words and actions, but humility is an attitude of the heart. You have to humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. I'm out of time today, but I've still got a lot more to share. I've got this book entitled, More Grace, More Favor. I promise you this would be a blessing. So I've got the book, CDs, DVDs, and we've got a free offer here for anybody who will get the other materials. We'll give you this as a bonus offer. Listen to our announcer, and please call or write today. Andrew's teaching, More Grace, More Favor, is available as a brand new book or as a CD or DVD album made from our daily television broadcast. Each of these valuable resources are available for a gift of any amount when you contact us. This entire series is also available for audio download absolutely free from our website. Or you can get the More Grace, More Favor package, which includes the book and your choice of either the CD or DVD album. This package has a catalog value of $50, but you can receive all of these valuable resources today for just $35. Also today, Andrew has a bonus offer. 
You can request the Self-Centeredness, the Source of All Grief booklet for free when you order either the book, CD, or DVD album from Andrew's new teaching, More Grace, More Favor. The free booklet is limited to one free per household and is only available in the U.S., U.K., Canada, and Australia. Go to awmi.net to see all the ways you can get these teachings. Jamie and I are here just to thank you so much for being partners with us. I tell you, we are reaching around the world. I remember when Jamie and I were it. I would run the sound while she was doing the praise and worship, and then she'd come back and run the sound while I was preaching. We did it all ourselves. Now we have so many people helping us, and it couldn't happen without you. It's very true. We're very thankful for our partners and what they're doing, and you're going around the world too, and everything that this Amen. ministry does. Amen. So we just wanted to say a special thank you, and uh, we love you. And every good thing that is happening through this ministry, you're going to share in every one of those rewards. So God bless you. Thank you for being a partner with us. You can become a Grace Partner or order resources through our website at awmi.net. Or you can call our helpline 24 hours a day, five days a week, Monday through Friday at 719-635-1111. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. Well, the minister's conference for me, it's really a time of refreshing. 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 Refreshing time with God. It's the most refreshing time of my year. Did you know that God created you for great things? He's placed His power and purpose inside you, and He wants to do more in your life than you can think or imagine. At Karis, get immersed in the Word of God and walk in power and purpose for a lifetime. At the time that I enrolled in classes, I wasn't able to move all the way to Colorado and you know, uproot my life. The flexibility of correspondence school was one of the biggest draws for me to enroll. I could get things done throughout the day and then I could go home and, and do my lessons. It's been such a blessing for me, for my family, just to see what God can do in a person's life when they just surrender and say, okay, God, I'll follow you. My name is Macy and I was a first year correspondence student. You can complete your first year of Karis Bible College as a correspondence student. Go to karisbiblecollege.org to learn more. I'd like to encourage all of you who claim to really have a relationship with the Lord to get out and vote in these upcoming elections. I'm amazed that there were over 25 million Christians registered to vote who did not vote in the last election cycle. I tell you, that's sin. That's wrong. We have not only the privilege, but a responsibility to vote. So I'd just like to encourage you to take your Christian responsibility to vote seriously. Get out and vote for righteousness this election.